Sue, uh, you told me a good story last night um, about uh, they, they were trying to get the best reaction. You going under the water when the shark drags you down, mm -hmm. and you were telling me, um, well, I guess you can tell the story again, um, how they did it as a sort of surprise so they can actually get a great uh, reaction from you. I told you the story last night. <laughs> <laughs> Where was I last night? <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, you were, you were saying that they were, they were doing a couple of rehearsals, and then you kind of got... They didn't warn you. As they didn't warn you. Oh, that was, in, that was when I was... Um, I told Stephen if he'd give me an hour with special effects, I could figure out how I was going to do the rigging, what I was going to do, and I wouldn't waste his time on set when they had a hundred people there. Well, they had a, an electric winch. And I didn't want to use it because if it overrode, I, I was in big trouble. So that didn't go over real big, but we did it with cables after all. Yeah, but the four, we had six guys, two on each, you know. We just ran real fast. Yeah, they had to work, not me. I'm just been there for the ride. Well, you yeah. did it incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, the, 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 the screaming and, and the water in the lungs and everything is uh, in looping. You know, and long after the film is finished, when we go back to fix the sound, you came in with a styrofoam, <laughs> a styrofoam cup of water that they poured down her throat while she, while she screamed. <laughs> Started waterboarding. <laughs> <laughs> For artistic purposes. Yes. Uh, Jeff, do, do you have any uh, remembrances of Roy Scheider working with Roy on that film? I do. I have, Roy Scheider is a big guy on that movie, and. I really have a lot of mem remembrances of Murray Hamilton, <laughs> who I really loved. Uh, uh, Murray kept a bottle of gin in my boot. Jaws uh, 2, he had gone to gin and milk, which was really good. Uh, but he was the consummate actor. He was married to one of the DeMarco sisters. He was such a special guy. And do you want to tell the story the of, the, of the, the, the kitty kitty? Yeah, kitty, kitty. Yeah. Uh, kitty, kitty. Every, every evening after shooting and after dinner, uh, Murray would go out for a, 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 cocktail or, a cocktail or a bottle. And, and on the way home to the hotel, if he didn't have a call the next morning, if he didn't have to be up early, and he, sometimes even if he had to be up early, it didn't matter. He was a professional. He could work, a, he could work with a hangover. He was walking home late at night in the streets of Martha's Vineyard, finding his way back to the hotel. There was a little kitty cat playing in the in the alley, and he bent over to stroke the kitty and said, "Hey, kitty, kitty, kitty!" And the kitty was nice. And then he continued and he walked into the lobby of the hotel, and the night clerk gagged and <laughs> wrenched because Murray had petted a skunk. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 so, so Martin Murray, and so Murray goes up to his room and closes the door and notices a terrible stench because you know, he's taking his clothes off now and his clothes are just reeking in a pile over here. So he can't sleep. He says, there's something terrible wrong, something terribly wrong in my room. And in the logic of, uh, in the 120 proof logic, he decided, well, I'll just get a blanket and sleep down in the lobby of the hotel on the couch where they found him in the morning and they had to burn his clothes <laughs> and wash him in tomato juice, which is, uh, you know, when you were like a dog, you know, who's been playing with a skunk. And then, he, but he made it to the set on time and it didn't cost us a minute of shooting, but it did provide us with many hours of happy stories. And, and you know, Joe talked about the production. The production saved and helped many businesses on Martha's Vineyard. It came in early in the season, supposed to be out by the time the season started, but of course, it went through the season into after season again. And uh, a lot of romances started there. Oh, we're going to talk about that now. Joe? <laughs> now, see? Now you know it was about him. I wasn't going to say a word. I was just going to be nice. Yeah, well, the... the uh, she was over 18. <laughs> no, 18. <laughs> there were a lot more women on the island than there were men, so they kept our guys pretty busy. Okay. <laughs> Especially the, the effects guys that made the teeth of Jaws. Oh, that's we good. made those things in... And the effects guys, Roy Abagas, who was ahead of that, he said, you know, because we they would break, so you'd have to have you know, new ones put in. 
He says, I don't know, I'm missing all these teeth. Well, the guys who are stealing them go to the bars and tell the girls, hey, I got a Jaws tooth here. <laughs> They were like they, they were like a get into bed free chip. <laughs> <laughs> if you were in, if you were in Las Vegas, it would have to be a, you know a pink thousand dollar chip. If you were on Martha's Vineyard in the summer of '74, you had a shark tooth. <laughs> Worked the same way, with the ladies. Could, could we have a mechanical shark story? Yeah, we got a lot of mechanical shark stories. It didn't work. It didn't work. <laughs> well, it, it, we were yeah, testing. We were testing, and the problem. Well, we had three sharks right to left, left to right, and uh, it, it took a while to get everything together. Uh, the platform shark, that was the one that would sink, it was very, very complicated. There were so many complicated things. The orca too, Bob had these, these barrels, and you would turn the barrels over and they'd fill with water, that would sink, that was how the, the platform worked. So, you know, uh, you, you can't underestimate what water does to electrolysis. You know, Especially salt water. The ocean salt eats, just eats everything. It up. And I, you know, you think, well, we're all so smart, we know about water. Well, Eisenhower planned Battle of Normandy, and they didn't do so well either because they had, you know, and the water was rough and they were losing people. Uh, it was very, very difficult. But the basic thing was the time element. You know, we started shooting in May, and then it was like, where's the shark? Where's the shark? And I had storyboarded everything, which I'm selling to those. Uh, and we planned it really tight. So I think Verna and I, uh, and we talked about this stuff. Uh, I had made these barrels for the boat, painted them yellow. And so then the barrels became the shark. Uh, and even the barrels were not easy. If you were going to do a barrel going down, the day before you had to take and drop a 2,000 pound weight so you could put a ship down there. So everything, everything had to be difficult. If you have a shark here, and you have a boat here, and you have an effects here, you've got, you've got three or four boats to anchor. You have to anchor them at four different points so they don't twist and run. So uh, if you go out there at seven to shoot, you're lucky if you get anything by 11 or 12. And then the sun starts shifting in the sky, and to yeah, get the right. light correct, you've got to move all the boats around. So the, the sun was on the left in the morning. It's still got to be on the left in the afternoon. Yeah, right. That means lifting four anchors for every boat, because you're anchoring them at four quarters to hold them steady. Yeah, what's and that? Water resetting. Water they made for how many, how many trillions of dollars? <laughs> I mean, it, it, yeah, and, and they were talking about, and there was something else that I, I didn't realize when I scouted it, and Stephen was very firm on this. He didn't want to see anything in the background. Well, in the winter, there were no boats out there. In the summer, they were all coming from Ionisport and all over. And, and some of them, we would be able to send boats out and say, would you mind sending them over here? Other people just did it to get in the way. Uh, and so that's why on Jaws 2, we went down to Florida. Uh, but, yeah, on, on land, when you're shooting, you, your second ADs and assistants go out with walkie-talkies and they close off both ends of the street and they hold the traffic. And so you're, all the cars on the street are your cars and you, you place them where you want, you do what you need. When you're shooting on the ocean and there's a boat 11 miles away, completely yeah. obvious on the horizon, you can't just send a PA with a radio <laughs> Yeah. Whizzing today, out in a Boston Whaler takes two hours to get to the horizon. Today we could have done it in CGI. You, you just, paint, paint them out in yeah. CGI. Joe but. says they went to Florida so they wouldn't have the problem. We had nuclear-powered aircraft carriers in the background. <laughs> it's hard to tell them to stop. <laughs> or to turn around because that takes half a day. <laughs> was, was the climax of Joe's uh, the ending, uh, was it the, in the finished version, was it close to what you had written? Yeah, yes. I mean, oh, there yeah, was, absolutely. And that, was, that was the thing. It was, you know, it's funny. There's a show on television called Mythbusters, and they, they busted the myth of the exploding yeah. air tank. And so scientifically, it, it doesn't work. But in the context of the movie, with the proper setup, and Hooper saying, be careful of those, they, you know, and, and all the attention that was paid to them by the time we, or, or Brody, um, employs the breathing tank as a homemade bomb, uh, and you know, shoots it, she's shooting at the shark, he hits the tank. Uh, 
the audience completely buys it. Yeah, nobody yeah, nobody yeah, ever yeah, said yeah, yeah. that yeah. wouldn't mm -hmm. happen. We used a squid. We had a lot of squid there. So we would fill up the explosive tanks with squid so it would look like pieces of the shark. So when the shark comes up into the, ca into the, uh, into the cabin, I had tied pieces of squid on the tee. Stephen says, what the heck's that? I said, well, that's Quint. A little bit of Quint. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should throw it open for questions because yeah, you know, yeah, we, yeah, we, we, we can go on for years as we have. Well, that's, that's a plan. So, next. Does anyone have questions? Oh, yeah, I have one for Carl. Sure. The uh, Robert Shaw scene in uh, the Indianapolis, how yes. did that come about? Really interesting. I'll, I'll be as brief as I can. In 1961, a book was written called Shark Attack, which described the sinking of the Indianapolis, including a scene in which a guy is bitten in half and turns upside down and is discovered by a shipmate. Later on, Howard Sackler, who had rewritten Peter Benchley's first draft, the Indianapolis speech, by the way, is not in the novel. It's only in the movie. Uh, and Quint's monomaniacal obsession with sharks, we thought, had to be explained. So Howard Sackler, who wrote the intervening draft between Peter Benchley and me, Sackler was a Navy guy. He knew about the Indianapolis. He knew about the thing. So he cobbled together this long speech that gives Quint a reason to hate sharks. Everybody was afraid of it because it's a two-page chunk of dialogue, which is very unusual for movies. Very rarely in a movie do you see an actor or a character talk for that long. And the Shaw was nervous about it. Stephen was nervous about it. Stephen had never directed a long dialogue scene like that. <clears throat> a director who had directed Shakespeare and soliloquies might have been comfortable with it, but you know, you know, Stephen was a young guy. Shaw, Shaw and, was nervous about that. Shaw was nervous about it too. Everybody was because it he it's his it's it's the equivalent of an aria in an opera, where one person steps forward, takes the stage, yeah. and tells the most dramatic story of the movie. So Stephen was asking everybody, all his writer friends, besides me, I was there writing, uh, and he was asking everybody, Bob Zemeckis, Bob Gale, Paul Schrader, uh, John Milius, all these people, you know, he called them and asked them for advice. Everybody sent in suggestions. Milius dictated a few lines over the phone. Uh, and then, <clears throat> and we were still worried. The day was approaching when we were going to have to shoot that because there was less and less left to shoot. So Shaw, one evening, comes to dinner with Stephen and myself and Verna Fields and Dick Zanuck and with a sheaf of papers in his hand. He's gotten all the research. He's gotten all the material. He's got a historical background on the Indianapolis. He says, I think I've got that speech now. And he read it to us that he had written, basically putting together all the elements of my scripts, Howard Sackler's script. None for Milius, by the way. Who takes credit? Who takes credit? <laughs> and I'm touchy about that, and there's an end note in the Jaws log which details the story completely. Um, in any case, Shaw, who was a playwright and a novelist, uh, a very accomplished writer in his own right, kind of assembled that speech as an actor would put it together for himself to read. Uh, and then when we were shooting it on the first day, he drank too much. And by the end of the day, he was slurring his words and making up parts of it. He had forgotten his own dialogue. He apologized to Stephen. Stephen said, we're here two days. Tell me you'll do it sober tomorrow. We'll come back tomorrow. He said that. He said, by, you know, on his honor as an actor, he did. And he came back. And the Indianapolis speech on the second day was letter perfect. But there are some great moments from the first day that are in the movie. And because Werner Fields is such an editor genius, you can't tell what was the first day, what was the second day. And because you're here today, I'll give you the secret. If you watch it on Blu-ray, which is the only way to really see it in detail, <clears throat> if Shaw's eyes are watery in the close-up, it's from the drunk day. <laughs> if his eyes are clear, it's from the second day. But it's such a masterful job of acting and directing and narrative. Uh, that it's uh, it's great, but no, you know, but the, and that's the story of the Indianapolis speech. Another question, uh, sir? You in the blue? 
since you did most of the filming out on the ocean with a mechanical shark, did you guys ever have any problems or encounters with the real thing? Uh, no, you know, on two we had some sharks circling and uh, people got a little panicked about it, but we really never had any problems. Yeah, that, that part of the world, uh, in, in the 70s, white sharks were a rarity in the New England coast. They've been seen, the, the whole Jaws yeah. story is based on an incident that happened in New Jersey, uh, in, Atlanta, in uh, Cape May in 1916, where some people were killed by sharks. But they're not, they don't, you know, yeah. you don't see them. You know, yeah. it was not a problem for yeah. us. You know, we sand sharks, blue sharks, little sharks, no, no big deal. Though when I fell in the water, the first thought in my head was, you know, we're making a movie about sharks. Do the sharks know that I'm writing about that? <laughs> I'm, I'm from New Jersey, and I want to tell you, you did a good job in that movie, because I have been in the ocean since 1975. <laughs> and I understand I'm not unique. Oh, no. no that's the, we've all heard that ever since the movie came out. Okay. Yes, uh, Carl, how did it get, come about that you got cast as the uh, unfortunate victim in the rowboat? Um, no, no, that's not me. No, that, 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 no, that, no, no, I'm. Oh, I'm, wait, that was Ted Grossman. That's Ted Grossman. Ted Grossman was a stunt double and. and good the, friend of uh, Dick Zanix. A, a great, a great a boyhood friend of Dick Zanix yeah. and a great, a good, great stunt man. Yeah. That, that's, yeah. That's, that's, that's Teddy's leg. Oh. <laughs> All the way to the back. Uh, how was uh, Robert Shaw cast? How did he uh, come to be cast? Well, it was two movie weeks movie. before production. <laughs> he was the third choice. He was the third choice. Richard Boone. Richard Boone Sterling was one Hayden. Sterling Hayden and uh, and Lee Marvin, who turned the part down because Lee Marvin was actually fishing in Baja California and didn't want to. He said he sent back a telegram. Said, "I'm I'm fishing. I don't want to make a movie about and, fishing. And I like fishing." fish. <laughs> And, and Shaw was the only one who was not a fisherman. Yeah, I mean, who, Boone was, uh, yeah. Uh, Sterling Hayden had Sterling been a, 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 yeah. a great, a Grand Bank story fisherman in his youth. He was the real deal. He so was, that's why he was like first choice. So that, yeah. But Shaw, uh, uh, Robert Shaw was, had been in the sting for Zanuck and Brown, and they said, look, we really need an actor of your you know, ability and stature. So please, please do it. We'll pay you a lot of money. And if you go over time, we'll pay you big penalties because we know you have other pictures waiting. And you, we know you'll have a tax problem if you work more than 90 days in the U.S. And as the picture dragged on and on, they started sending Shaw to Canada every day he was not working <laughs> so that he wouldn't pile up the days on his visa. And, the, and eventually, you know, that strategy gave way and Shaw was still on and they paid a huge bump. As an actor, I think Shaw made more money than any other actor in the movie because of his penalties. It would have been interesting, I'm just imagining Richard Boone in this movie. Yeah. He would the struggles would... to get him to show up. Yeah, well, he... well I worked in a television series with Hank Ramsey. He's a pretty reliable person. Yeah. yeah. I liked him a lot. And, and big rugged guy, which was that was needed for the character. Yeah. There's somebody all the way in the back. Yes. Uh, for Susan, uh, do you recall the name of the stuntman who had recommended you for that crucial part? Paul Stater. He uh, did a, uh, what was the big boat movie that went down? Uh, Poseidon. Poseidon. And he did all kinds of water movies. He was also the first man to ever ride an elephant, stand on an elephant's back for Tarzan. <laughs> <laughs> Time for one more last question. Lady. Yeah. I have a question for everybody. Um, you all had your little part in making the movie when you saw it. What did you think? I, I could only say this, um, because I was so closely tied to the shark, so to speak, that the crew would laugh. Because the shark made funny noises with the rams. <laughs> and then they would laugh. And, and, and the longer we were on the island, they got island fever, they were crazy. I was concerned that the audience would laugh. And then when the first screening I saw in Long Beach, California, they didn't laugh. And, yeah. You know, I always like to think of it, in a sense, as the perfect storm. You know, if you looked at it individually, you'd think this is going to be an unbelievable disaster. Uh, and when all these elements come together, and trust me, it doesn't happen often, but when they do, it just was the perfect storm. And you look at it in hindsight, and you know, 
how blessed that the shark didn't work, so you didn't have to show it too much and maybe risk a laugh at it or whatever. But everything just worked out. And please don't think that this is the recipe for how to make these things, because trust me, it's not. And in this new corporate world where corporations own all the studios and everything, they would never permit a big studio film to go forward like this. Yeah, kind of unprepared into the breach. This was a small movie. We shot some in my driveway. We shot some in, in, in the editor's pool. They had coming out. I mean, as big as it was, it was also very small. It was a small, relatively small group of people that were really bind, bound together to get the same bait. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.